Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. And I am um, presenting today on tips and strategies for educators to help an unmotivated kid. Just to start, I have to give a few uh, disclosures. Uh, the most uh, relevant is that I receive royalties from Gilterford Press for a book on um, interventions for adolescents with ADHD. Today, the goals of our webinar are to understand where academic motivation comes from, how does ADHD interfere with academic motivation, and what can educators do to build self-motivation in students with ADHD? We're going to start out by just understanding the components of um, academic motivation. Let's talk about Kevin. He is a 14 year old uh, eighth grader who loves video games. He makes sort of mediocre grades, mostly because he's missing work or he has careless errors um, on the work that he turns in. Kevin has a diagnosis of ADHD and takes ADHD medication. His teachers say he rarely studies. Uh, he says sometimes he'll read over a study guide right before the test. Mostly he tells his parents that he doesn't have homework, that he does it at school. Teachers say the homework that he's uh, turning in looks rushed through. Parents are saying they want him to advocate for himself more with his teachers. Um, and he says that there's no point, um, you know, school's just not his thing. He thinks school's boring, not useful. And when he graduates, um, he wants to run a YouTube channel. So um, let's talk about what might be going on for Kevin. So the goal of um, academic engagement is for students to be an active participant in their own learning. And today we're gonna highlight three factors that influence academic engagement, motivational factors, cognitive factors, and behavioral factors. And we'll look at how ADHD can get in the way of all three of these and what you can do. Starting with motivational factors, um, there's certainly a lot of things we could put on this slide, but today I'm gonna highlight three. Um, intrinsic motivation, which is, do students find what they're learning interesting? Is school en engaging? Is it enjoyable for them? Self-efficacy, do students believe that they're capable of being successful in school? And extrinsic motivation, are there personally meaningful academic consequences for that student to work hard and engage in school? With respect to cognitive factors, we can look at a few different aspects of student cognition that influence academic engagement, ac executive functions, uh, strategic planning, the ability to memorize, to seek information, to get oneself organized to complete tasks. And so the key point here is that students may be very motivated and interested in school, but if they can't get themselves organized and they can't pick out the right strategies to succeed, um, that motivation only gets them so far because they lack the ability to follow through on that motivation. And then finally, we have behavioral factors. So this includes uh, a student's ability to structure their environment into whatever they need it to be to successfully learn, whether that's creating a quiet space for themselves or picking out the right time of day to work. It involves things like keeping notes, being able to review your materials before a test, knowing when to seek assistance from peers and adults. And so if we look at Kevin, we can look at um, how these factors might be influencing his school engagement. So intrinsic motivation, we heard him say school is boring. Self-efficacy, school's just not my thing. Extrinsic motivation, I'm not learning anything useful. And he doesn't see a link between what he's actually interested in, which is mostly video games and digital technology and school. With respect to the cognitive factors, we see that he lacks um, self-organization and executive function strategies. And behaviorally, um, he's not studying, he rushes through his work, and he doesn't seek help. So for someone like Kevin, how is ADHD influencing their academic engagement? What do we know from the research? So let's start with intrinsic motivation. Um, we know that ADHD is associated with abnormal anticipatory dopamine functioning in the brain. And because of this, students experience lower levels of what we would call endogenous pleasure, or essentially like the good feelings that the chemicals in our brains give us during learning. So think about reading a book you're really interested in, you're learning, it, you know, you, you feel good reading it, you're engaged, you're focused. People with ADHD, they don't get as many of those chemicals um, acting like that during a task, like a typical learning task. And so for them, it's harder to engage. Students with ADHD also report lower levels of interest in academics in general. They find lengthy assignments aversive. 
They have lower experiences of novelty, curiosity, and enjoyment during a typical academic task compared to their peers. And they have the most trouble with repetitive and complex tasks, things that feel hard or boring. And so students with ADHD actually experience this subjective feeling of mental discomfort during tasks that have delayed rewards. So for persons with ADHD, as we'll see in a second, their brain is most engaged when there are kind of like immediate payoff to um, whatever the task is that they're performing. In the absence of a payoff like that, a long-term project, a final exam, um, they have a hard time keeping themselves focused. And so this explains why students with ADHD have a high preference for immediately rewarding activities like video games and social media, and they have lower preference for things like studying for a test. Now, with respect to extrinsic motivation, like we talked about, there's this built-in preference for immediate reinforcement, and that prevents students from actually valuing long-term reinforcers like grades, a final exam score, um, those are symbolic reinforcers, right? An A is just a letter uh, to some people, to other people it means something important to them and it's what the letter means that keeps them working, a symbol. It's not actually the letter A. So students with ADHD have not only insensitivity to long-term positive consequences, but also long-term negative consequences. So they actually have less day-to-day -day motivation to avoid negative threats, for example, of things like failing the year, or getting suspended. Um, students with ADHD in general value academic achievement less um, and value um, mastering the material less compared to peers. And so this is all from research studies. And then this piece of self-efficacy, we see that students with ADHD tend to receive kind of years of continuous criticism from peers, teachers, and even themselves um, and parents that can add up. And so this can lead to people having negative beliefs about themselves, especially as they get into the older grades like middle and high school. And so because students with ADHD hold beliefs about themselves, like even when I try, I still don't succeed, that influences the level of effort that they can be willing to put into assignments. Beyond the motivational factors, we know that the specific cognitive factors that promote academic engagement are also impaired in people with ADHD, um, most notably the executive functions. And this is things like your working memory, response inhibition, cognitive flexibility. These executive functions are weaker by definition um, in people with ADHD, and they can interfere with um, pursuing goal-directed academic behaviors. So people with ADHD have trouble not only figuring out um, what their goal is, you know, get an A on this test, finish this homework assignment, but also figuring out the exact steps that would be strategic to take in order to efficiently meet that goal. Because of this disorganization and the way that they think and the way that they learn, um, they also have their academic engagement um, undermined on the cognitive front as well. And then we have behavioral factors. So students with ADHD often lack adaptive skills, things like study skills, um, how to keep themselves organized, note-taking, time management, how to communicate effectively and clearly with peers and adults. And so on all of these fronts, you know, students with ADHD are struggling and we as educators, as clinicians, as people working with students with ADHD, um, can do certain things to help promote learning in the classroom and academic motivation. So I'm going to go over, I think, like five ideas with you all today. One is harnessing the natural interests of the student. So we learned a second ago that students with ADHD have less natural curiosity, enjoyment, and interest in day-to-day -day school work. And so we have to create opportunities for these students to make choices about areas of work and play that interest them most to be able to harness the intrinsic motivation that they do have for their actual interests. Um, so we can find out what they're interested in and we can think about creative ways to weave these natural interests into learning tasks. For older students, this might be a bigger picture thing, considering helping them figure out what educational paths connect most to their interests and helping them take classes in those areas or choose topics for long-term projects that are related to things they're interested in. Asking yourself, what can you do to maximize this particular student's curiosity and enjoyment in your classroom? Um, because students with ADHD, this is great for everyone, but students with ADHD really need this to stay engaged. 
Number two is thinking about how we can build self-efficacy. Um, personally, I think one of the hardest things for a person with ADHD is that depletion of self-esteem that can happen for them over time. And we talk specifically about kind of a subcategory of self-esteem, which is called self-efficacy, because it has a lot to do with academics, what you think you're capable of. And there are things we know we can do um, to help improve self-efficacy in students. Some of them are on the slide, social encouragement. So catching them doing things well and making sure whenever you do that you acknowledge those efforts. Creating visual monitoring of progress so students can see themselves advancing and learning and growing, right? So level systems, graphs, sticker charts, um, academic performance metrics that are kind of positively focused, right? It's always moving in the right direction um, where you can sort of see yourselves leveling up or moving up in your progress. And it's not just about what we do, but also what we make sure we avoid doing so that we don't undermine any progress we're making with some of these positive strategies making sure that we avoid shaming and blaming students, which will just reduce their self-efficacy further, setting fair expectations uh, that are individualized to the student, matched to their ability level, so that we can kind of have opportunities to celebrate incremental success and not just um, you know, the end game criterion. We also wanna to communicate to students that we value effort more than achievement so that when somebody does feel like, I'm not good at this, it's no point in trying because I won't succeed, that there is a point in trying because that just that trying alone is something that's valued in this classroom. Um, and one really good rule of thumb for students who might be prone to getting more corrective feedback than the average student is to make sure you have that two to one ratio of positive feedback to negative or corrective feedback so that the students are hearing more positive message about themselves in the classroom than they are negative messages about themselves in the classroom. Number three is enhancing the desirability of positive academic behaviors. So we talked a little while ago about personally meaningful reasons to be engaged in school. I mean, obviously there's some things here we could all call out as universals, right? It, it's good to finish school. It's good to go to college. It's good to, um, you know, please your parents, but those universals aren't actually meaningful to everyone. And so finding out for that particular student, what is meaningful for them about an academic engagement? How can that help them with something that they care about? And sometimes with students with ADHD, it's especially hard to find a natural, personally meaningful benefit that would be motivating enough to change behavior. And so when that happens, you could consider implementing an extrinsic reward system um, when a natural motivator can't be identified. So this is a tool in your toolbox and it really looks different at different ages. Um, in elementary school, um, I'll show you some of these ideas in a second, but we can think about things like classroom behavior games, school home reward system, token economies. In middle school, um, homeschool reward systems can often be effective. Um, and in high school, you know, it's a little bit of a different ball game, but what some of the work my team's been doing is working on social reinforcement for, from peers, like a peer mentorship model um, to be, you know, possibly an effective reinforcer for that age. So a lot more work to be done with the older students, but different people are working on that right now. And hopefully, you know, as the years goes on, we'll have more answers. Fourth strategy here is really to model and focus on this idea of goal setting. Goals are great because they combine a couple of the ideas we've already talked about. First of all, it helps students identify and think about their priorities, think about what is personally meaningful for them. Goals can be used as a short-term strategy um, of getting through you know, a, a time when you're sitting down to do work or um, getting through the week, but it can also be like a long-term strategy, like you know, a grade you'd like to get in class by the end of the quarter. And for people with ADHD, one of the most important aspects of this is helping people identify concrete steps that they can take to meet those goals, um, because that's where they struggle most. It's not just, you know, being able to identify something that they want to happen, but exactly what do I need to do day to day to make that happen? And so um, a way to reinforce this is by tracking progress on goals visually, helping students sort of self-monitor. And in some cases, again, um, considering using reinforcement, either social or tangible, um, for students who meet milestones. So whether it's, um, you know, giving them a sticker to wear that says that they, um, you know, made it to the next level for their reading, whether it's having a round of applause in the classroom or whether it's actually having some sort of reward, 
students are different and you got to pull different tools out of your toolbox for different students with ADHD. Uh, some of you guys are probably familiar with the SMART goal um, rubric. So this is just something that I think is great. Uh, you know, thinking about setting goals with students, especially older ones that are specific, that are measurable, that are actually attainable for that student, relevant and time-based, which means that um, it has a deadline to it. Lastly, I wanna talk about promoting academic engagement behaviors. And so this is, um, the idea of coming up with key target behaviors that you think the student could um, perform that would enhance academic engagement in your setting. And this could be a range of things, depends on the age of the student, depends on what their key areas of difficulty are. You see on here participating in class, following rules, completing assignments thoroughly, keeping an organized book bag, studying for tests, writing down homework in a planner. And so some of the keys um, to promoting these behaviors are setting clear expectations between you and the student of exactly what you want to see, or if they're an older student, exactly what they want to see from themselves, uh, making sure the student knows how to perform the behavior. Sometimes the failures to um, meet your expectations are due to a failure of actually not really knowing how or what they're supposed to be doing. And so we always have to check that and teach um, strategies as needed and then reinforcing the behavior as needed. And so again, that can be social reinforcement, just saying, hey, I noticed, you know, um, giving them that positive encouragement and feedback or for students who might have um, more difficulties with motivation, it could be something tangible. So let's go through the age groups for a second and just sort of share what people are doing um, to help with focusing on academic behaviors in school. Really basic behavioral contingency systems in the classroom. The idea that even though you may be thinking about how to modify the behavior of one child, you can get the whole class involved in that, right? And so here you're doing a class-wide intervention, but you know that you're really most interested in promoting good behaviors in certain subgroup of kids. Um, so you have the stoplight system here where kids start on green every day and have opportunities to um, go down to a yellow or a red day if they aren't meeting certain expectations, but of course, importantly, can always go back, earn their way back to a green by the end of the day by good behaviors. And then you may have different rewards for the class for a green um, versus a yellow day. Um, maybe things like who gets to line up first if you're, um, if that's something your class cares about, um, or kids who get um, to have a little extra recess. Another example would be a token economy system that you might use for a specific child. Or you can do a class-wide system with something like, you know, school dollars um, where you can earn uh, tokens throughout the day or throughout the week and then have um, an opportunity to trade them in for something that's desirable um, by the end of the day or the end of the week. And then a group contingency would be like the good behavior game. So being able to identify maybe a target behavior for that particular student, but get the whole um, class involved, right? And so you divide the class into two teams. The teams earn points for following the rule throughout the day. They lose points for uh, breaking the rule throughout the day. And at the end of the day, you announce which team won and the winning team gets some sort of privilege or reward. Again, it doesn't have to be anything tangible. It can be, you know, getting to line up first. It can be um, whatever it is that might be something exciting for the kids in your class. And then finally, this is uh, the daily report card intervention. So this is when you get the parents involved. And here's um, the intervention that kind of links home and school communication. Same idea as you're listing the target behaviors at school. The teacher is going to indicate on some sort of form or card, or now we're doing this electronically, you know, if the teacher, if the child met the um, goals for the day, which gives the parent the information that they need to um, do rewards at home. And so when you do have a kid who's really struggling, um, the, that homeschool communication can be the most powerful way to kind of back up what's going on um, at school with something that might be personally meaningful to the child at home. Um, one thing I wanna just make a note on is the importance of involving the child in that conversation. You want it to be a positive thing, um, you know, a tool to help them focus where they get to potentially earn rewards. Um, understand how it works instead of something that we're imposing on the child. Now, as we move into secondary school, um, we can't really use those same rewards or token-based reinforcement systems because those things don't mean as much to older children. Um, for older students, we're gonna have a much greater focus on skill development and practice rather than um, you know, behavior modification. Um, 
we want to do some important key things for older kids, offer a rationale for why the task is necessary. You know, I'd like you to spend at least 30 minutes on homework each day so that I can make sure you pass the class. Acknowledge when the child is saying that the task is dull or boring, you know, don't argue with them to say, you know, I get this, that this isn't your favorite class, but I still like really want to work with you on trying to succeed. And when they don't see a point, acknowledge that again, rather than arguing, um, ask them for a compromise, ask if they'd strike a deal with you. Um, this is the best way to get engagement. Now, with that greater focus on skills, there are a few um, interventions out there um, that kind of give you a, a how-to manual on uh, middle school organization, time management and planning and how to build academic engagement. The one I'm highlighting here is the HOPS intervention um, by Josh Langberg. And um, you've got all parts of the academic engagement involved, right? You've got academic motivation, you've got teaching the skills, um, and you've got an parent engagement piece as well that's optional. And finally, for the high schoolers, like I said, really, this is a new area. Um, my team's been working a lot with peer interventions and pairing um, successful 11th and 12th graders up with younger students with ADHD that are struggling, helping them with social reinforcement, goal setting, monitoring progress, modeling executive function skills. So we've been doing research on that, and that's been positive and probably more effective in that age group than, than doing like token reinforcement or rewards. So, so we'll just close by going back to Kevin for a second. Um, you know, what could we do to help him based on what we learned? So we could help him identify courses for high school that are going to interest him as he gets older. We could use an intervention like HOPS to promote um, skills and executive function and motivation. We could get him some home reinforcement going on, maybe related to video game time. Um, we can help him set some SMART goals and find small opportunities to provide encouragement and reinforcement. And, you know, it's not like there's one shotgun approach where you just throw an intervention at a kid and they get better in a few weeks. It's really the little things we do over time for students that makes a difference, you know, and builds up. So just to conclude, we've learned today that students with ADHD are at risk for motivation and executive function difficulties at school. We have some strategies in our toolbox that we went over to address these. It's gonna be a different combination for every student. You guys as educators know your students, you're gonna know which ones here are most relevant and what would work in your classroom. And by having as many things as we can in our toolbox, we can pick the right ones out for the right students and hopefully um, address both the behavioral, the cognitive and the motivation aspects of what's going on. Could you explain a little bit more about what is HOPS? So HOPS is a middle school-based intervention where a school staff member is um, pulling out a um, student for about 30 minutes 20 to 30 minutes twice a week, and they are helping them get organized with their materials, um, set up plans for getting homework done, helping them think, do things like write in a daily planner, and they're just sort of meeting with them for a few minutes twice a week, reinforcing that, and then working with parents to, um, as needed, do rewards at home to reinforce as well. So that's one intervention that I, um, I just highlight because it's publicly available, um, kind of that works well in the middle school age group and has a lot of research to back it. How do you handle a student's lack of motivation if it's expressed in an oppositional behavior style and it's disrupting class? There isn't one answer to this question, um, but what I would encourage you all to do is to start with a functional analysis of their behavior, which means um, whether it's just the teacher themselves or you have support folks at your school, um, really trying to understand like what are the antecedents that cause this behavior to be triggered? What are potentially the um, forces that are reinforcing, you know, this behavior to continue to occur? Is it intention seeking? Is it um, because the student's angry or not getting enough sleep? And once you can kind of understand what is influencing the behavior, then you can put together a plan that really um, addresses those factors, as well as um, often we know oppositional behaviors at school do re respond well to something like those um, those uh, behavior games or those token reinforcement systems that I mentioned. So a little bit of sort of uh, individualized work that works that needs to happen to figure out exactly the solution for a specific student, but that's the category of intervention I'd, I'd be looking at first. How would you approach a Montessori classroom for motivation where competition and rewards are not really part of how they handle curriculum? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you guys are the experts in Montessori style, and I definitely am not. So I want to say that. Um, that being said, there's that social aspect of reinforcement that I think is a universal of encouraging st students of noticing when they do things well. And I think there's probably pieces of that that are a fit with your philosophy. Um, I think the intrinsic motivation piece is going to be really um, compatible from what I know about um, Montessori education, right? Um, trying to let kids make choices about the things that they're most interested in and helping them um, develop skills and learning in the context of what they're naturally drawn to. So um, I think you, this is a toolbox. And I think I like the idea of all of you coming from different backgrounds, being able to review these tools and, and pick out a few that really feel like they're fit with your philosophy. So we have a couple of questions that are somewhat related. It's um, how do you have, get your teachers and your school administrators on board so sometimes you have um, either teachers who are enthusiastic, but maybe don't execute as well, or maybe you have school administration that isn't as supportive. So if you've got a couple of ideas on that. Okay. Um, so I think the number one thing that parents can do is make sure that you have um, formal accommodations in place for a student with ADHD, whether that's a 504 plan or an individualized education plan. If you're in the US, those are your options. And the reason for that is, A, it gets everyone on the same page. It helps um, signal to the teachers who are the students that need more help and what they need more help with. Um, after that has occurred, um, it is the case that there could be variable implementation of those plans by um, schools. And I think it's really important for us to see both sides of that to see that schools can be under-resourced and want to do all of the things in those IEPs, but literally not have enough minutes in their day to do it for all the students that they're called on to do that for. So I think it's important to increase homeschool communication as much as we can, to be patient with each other, to be positive with each other. And as a parent, if you really do feel honestly that you've looked at the situation and the school is not doing what they should be, um, despite your efforts that you've documented to try, you do have recourse you know, to take that up with um, either through the legal system or with someone within the school district. But usually it doesn't need to get to that point with, with good communication. We have a few people asking about the HOPS program. Uh, can you advise where they can get copies of that resource? So uh, that is on Amazon. You can um, sort of type in uh, the HOPS program for ADHD middle school. The author is Josh Langberg. I think some combination of those search terms would probably get you the right place. Do you have any technology ideas that would help facilitate executive function in the classroom? I think that's a Big question, and I think depends on what kind of classroom you're in, et cetera. Um, some of the work that we're doing in high school is related to um, helping students leverage the technology that's existing at their schools because schools are already usually implementing um, programs and implementing all new stuff is often burdensome, but just uh, increasing students' use of the technology, having them go on daily and look at what their grades are, having them write down assignments that are missing. Um, we have a peer meet with them and they look at that together and they problem solve together. Uh, the peer kind of helps them advocate with teachers when they need to ask for extra time. So I think it's more about um, like making use of what's available to you and getting greater compliance with the expectations than it is that there's some like special tool that's really gonna be a game changer. When you have a student who kind of is verbally agreeing with the strategies in the classroom, but the execution is somewhat lacking and there's just a disconnect there, do you have any um, advice on how to kind of bring them back on track? Yeah, I mean, it's that same sort of answer to that oppositional question because there's just so many reasons that it could be happening. Um, we'd always want to acknowledge the positive um, interest in doing well in school that is there. And then we want to find out like what's at the root of the actual issue with the follow through. Um, as you guys know, for ADHD, there's two evidence-based treatments. One of them is um, stimulant medication. The other one would be um, using some of the behavioral strategies in the classroom like I've been going over. So you have both of those options to pursue um, and probably have something effective that you could um, draw from there, but you want to use positive strategies with a kid who has a good attitude, right? Because using punitive strategies when you have a good attitude is only going to like put a risk for demoralization. So it's great that they'll like probably be working with you and you really just want to reinforce um, incrementally, just increasing good behaviors and acknowledging effort. Another hops question, is this something that somebody could request as an accommodation or is it more of a classroom strategy? 
Um, the components of it could be uh, requested as a as something on an IEP, for example, uh, twice a week increased monitoring of organization skills could be on an IEP, right? And that requires somebody to check in and check the kid's organization twice a week. Um, you can ask for uh, a weekly note home, which could give a summary of how that's going. Um, but you really need the school to have the resources to pull kids out and meet with them in small groups or individually, I think, in order for that to be feasible. So um, the whole package would be something that I think a school would probably have to make a decision that they had the bandwidth to take on or not. Um, but that to be said, because there are some parent questions here, that same work can be done in a clinic. So if your schools aren't able to help, you know, you can go to a therapist, a, a cognitive behavioral therapist, and they can do that kind of work. That's a lot of the work that my team also does is working with therapists and clinicians about how they can do that type of organization skills training in weekly meetings somebody who doesn't work at the school. So you do have options if the school isn't the best um, place for you to leverage those resources.